morning again. If you guys are willing and able, let's stand as we begin this time of worship. So as I do have done in the past, let's just take a few moments to uh, quiet our hearts and uh, quiet our thoughts this morning as we come before the Lord. So let's just take a few moments in uh, silent reflection. Father, we thank you for who you are. We thank you for this opportunity to come before you this morning and lift you up in song and praise. We thank you for your goodness and your faithfulness. We thank you that you never leave us. We give you the praise this morning. It's your breath in our lungs, so we pour out our praise, we pour out our praise. It's your breath in our lungs, so we pour out our praise to you only. And great are you, Lord. You give life. Pour out our praise 
the king of my heart be the mountain where I run, the fountain I drink from, oh, he is my song. And let the king of my heart be the shadow where I hide, the ransom for my life, oh, he is my song, cause you are the king of my heart be the wind inside my sails the anchor in the waves oh he is my song let the king of my heart be the fire inside my veins the echo of my days oh he is my song cause you are good you're good You're never gonna let me down. You're never gonna let. You're 
never gonna let me down. You're never gonna let. You're never gonna let me down. You're never gonna let. You're never gonna let me down. You're never gonna let. You're never gonna let. Father, we thank you. We praise you this morning. We thank you that no matter what's holding on to us or holding us back or making us feel far from you, that you're still holding on tight to us. I pray that each one of us would feel that you're the king and savior of our hearts this week. This morning, as we dive into scripture and your word, I pray that we would just feel your presence here in this place, moving and molding us into a creation that reflects you. I pray that you would receive all the glory in this place this morning. In your name, amen. You may be seated. Thank you. And children, uh, if you have children, now's the time they're dismissed this morning as well. Good morning. Good morning. How many were uh, shaken, shooken, whatever that word is, out of your beds the other night at about three in the morning? At least that's when it happened in Gresham. That was fun. Amen. Yeah, God's uh, that's God's sprinkler system. Hallelujah. Uh, Cindy for Christmas. Um, I uh, got me one of these fancy weather monitor stations that tells the time, the temperature, the humidity, what it was yesterday, what it'll be tomorrow, how much rain in this hour, how much rain in this day. And in that, probably about a half an hour, at least in Gresham, we got 66 one hundredths of an inch of rain. Uh, you know, praise God. Praise God. Hallelujah. Well, do you like rain? It's good stuff. It's good stuff. God keeps the earth green. Uh, by providing the rain, by providing the sun. Um, we love him, right? Amen. Let's pray. Our Father and our God, this morning we come to you. We thank you that you are good. You are oh so good, Father. You are gracious. You are kind. You are loving. You are the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. You are the Spirit who dwells within. You are our hope. You are our security. You are our sovereign Lord. We praise you. We pray the presence, the ministry of your spirit, guiding us into the truth of your word. Father, that we may know you better. Whom to know is life eternal. 
We pray these things, we thank you, in Christ's name, amen. Well, this past, well, what, six months, whatever it's been, uh, carrying on more and more, um, the COVID with all its restrictions, everything else, and then most recently, of course, uh, with the fires, um, which hopefully these rains have severely uh, cut back on the fires, the protests, the politics, it's not uncommon to hear someone say, getting God into the conversation. Well, God is in control or God is sovereign. That's true. That's very true. Uh, while serving as pastor, uh, Valley Bible Church chapter, California, and not uncommon in a board meeting if we're discussing something and a particular issue problem uh, may come up. And um, Tim, Tim Powell, uh, at times would comment, well, God is sovereign. You know, and praise God, we know that for sure. Amen? You believe that? Amen. Well, that's what we're going to be talking about today and what that means on a personal, individual basis. Um, it depends uh, how you understand it, how you define it, and how you apply it. Uh, COVID, well, we had uh, the plagues in uh, Israel, in Egypt, I mean, when the Israelites were there, the firstborn, in every single household was taken. Uh, tens of thousands, probably, depending on what the population of uh, Egypt was at that time. Some said up into the hundreds of thousands passed that night. Well, does that mean that then God is responsible for the plagues of today and most apparent and most uh, current in our hearts and in our minds, and that is uh, the COVID? So is he choosing who will and who will not get it? Well, Psalm, uh, one, Psalm 91, in the section of verse 2 through 6, verse 2 and 3, <clears throat> seems to tell us that God uh, may choose to spare us from the deadly pestilence and plagues. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. Surely He will save you from the fowler's snore, snare and from the deadly pestilence. Well, if He chooses to, He certainly can. The fires, well, there's plenty of verses about that, too. When I got looking into it, I was rather surprised. In Jeremiah 21, 14, I will punish you as your sins deserve, declares the Lord. I will kindle fire in your forest. And then Hosea 8, 14, but I will send fire on their cities that will consume their fortresses. Uh, Cindy, working at Fred Meyer Jewelers over in Portland, Gresham, uh, yesterday had a, an elderly gentleman come in, and he was just looking for a watch band. And uh, when she was, you know, as you do in sales, you try to get addresses and this and that, so you can keep contact with them. And when it came to asking for an address, he says, I don't have one. He'd lost everything in the fire. There's also passages in Joel, Ezekiel, Hosea about the Lord starting fires in forests. Does that mean that he sent every lightning bolt, that he lit every match that set our forest on fire recently? But Isaiah 43, 2 says, when you walk through the fire, you'll not be burned. Well, then what about the 40 plus people who have died so far as a result of these fires and the the scores more who were injured by them and the thousands who lost their homes. <laughs> so, so, so what's going on? Is, is God in control? Is he sovereign? Is he almighty God? Uh, who is he? Or are the insurance companies right when they see anything they don't like? They say, well, it's an act of who? God. Just blame it on God. It's amazing they don't. Give God credit for all the good things that go on in our world. Well, you may not ever get the virus, and pray you don't. God forbid your house should ever burn. But maybe your marriage is going up in flames right now. Maybe the virus of envy, bitterness, or anger may be keeping you in a prison of unforgiveness. Where is God in all of this? 
Is he, in fact, in control the way we would think of in control? Uh, is he truly sovereign? Does he care? Can he care? Well, yes, of course, we know he's sovereign. He's God with a big G. And if he's not sovereign, then he's not God with a big G. Then he's just a small G God. It's like the old chorus. He's got the whole world in his hands. Yes, he's God. He's the Lord God. He's the Lord God Almighty. Uh, sovereign Lord, as uh, the NIV translates one of his names, is used 270, 297 times in contrast with God, the more generic name, general name, 3,995. And you, yes, you could substitute capital G-O-D for any of the other names, and you'd be talking about the same person. But when the writers of Scripture, by the inspiration of the Spirit of God, put in another name, then they're pointing to a particular characteristic quality, relational aspect of our God. Sovereign, according to Strong's, is a supreme ruler, especially a monarch, one who possesses supreme power, unlimited in extent, absolute autonomy, not tied into, not giving way to, uh, paying heed to anyone else, absolute autonomy. Well, our God is the sovereign Lord of the universe, as NIV 297 times translates that one. He's God Almighty. Well, now, that, that being the case in his sovereignty, then where do we fit into that? Does that mean we're just puppets predestined to do this and not do that? Are we, by divine fiat uh, decision of the Almighty, locked into the futility of fatalism? There's really nothing we can do. That's just who he is, and this is just who I am. Will your questions about COVID, will your questions about the fire, or when someone relates about how they were personally affected by it, maybe you, uh, will those questions go away as a result of our time together here today? Um, maybe, I hope, to a certain extent, but more important, it is, more important is that we get to know our God a little better today. As Paul for the Ephesians prayed in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 15 to 17 in there somewhere. I pray that you may be given a spirit of wisdom and revelation that you might know him better. Not, not know the book better, and certainly we need to be people of the book, we need to know the book, we need to be reading it, studying it, memorizing it. But ultimately, and hopefully through our time together here today, it will be that we get to know him better. That we grow in our relationship with him as our sovereign Lord. Well, who is he in his sovereignty? What is he like? Amos 4, verse 2, tells us he is holy in his sovereignty. The sovereign Lord has sworn in his holiness. God, because he's absolute monarch, uh, can choose however he wants to run his kingdom. And he does it by virtue of his holiness. Israel at that time had not returned to the Lord, so God is warning of judgment and saying by his holiness that he has a right to do so because they don't measure up to his standards. His sovereignty is governed by his holiness. It is never out of control, never on a wild whim. Sovereignty could never be used then for evil if it's tied in, governed by the holiness of God. It could only be exercised then for the ultimate good of those involved. He's holy in his sovereignty. He's righteous in his sovereignty. Psalm 71, verse 16, I will come and proclaim your mighty acts, O sovereign Lord. I will proclaim your righteousness. Righteous, uh, elsewhere translated, can be translated as honest, just, right, truthful. This tells us that everything that he does in all our interaction with him, will always be done above board, honest, done right on a moral and spiritual plane. No spin, contrary to our news agencies today, 
No fake news with God. Well, how, how did he reveal his sovereignty in the past? If you jump into the Old Testament, what was going on back then? Well, because he is sovereign, we'll see that he's open, open to change. He's open to responding to the prayers, the pleas of his people. And not because he has to, but because he's seeking genuine relationships, not arbitrary domination. But back to Amos again, chapter 7, verse 1 through 7. And notice the number of times God is referred to as sovereign Lord. This is what the sovereign Lord showed me. He was preparing swarms of locusts after the king's share had been harvested, and just as the late crops were coming up. When, he had stripped the, when they had stripped the land clean, I, Amos, I cried out, Sovereign Lord, forgive! How can Jacob survive? He is so small. So the Lord relented. Or, as New American translates it, the Lord changed his mind about this. Continuing verse 4, this is what the Sovereign Lord showed me. The Sovereign Lord was calling for judgment by fire. It dried up the great deep and devoured the land. Then I cried out, Sovereign Lord, I beg you, stop. Who's he addressing here? <laughs> sovereign Lord. Stop. I beg you, stop. How can Jacob survive? He's so small. So the Lord relented. He changed his mind. This will not happen either, the sovereign Lord said. And the passage goes on to say, but I'm bringing in a plumb line to see if a wall is true or straight or not. A uh, home up on the property that, where Brother Tim lives, a uh, person who bought some land there built this 9,000 plus square foot home. Uh, beautiful thing. But if you look at the, the upper balcony and then the supporting pillar, uh, just by looking at it, you can tell that it's probably an inch or two out of plumb. They've gone to court over that and many other things. God saying, I'm bringing in a plumb line to see if Israel is plumb in their relationship with me. <clears throat> so what does this tell us? We serve the sovereign Lord of the universe, who, because of the fact that he is sovereign can and may and has chosen to respond to the heart situation of his people, to the prayers of his people. What he's doing, he's seeking genuine, personal, working relationships. God's not cold or autocratic in his sovereignty. He's near, he's close, he's real, he's personal. And, and my friends, brothers and sisters, what this... What this does for prayer is make it real and vital, living. As James said, the prayer of a righteous man is what? It's powerful. It's effective. I believe personally it's, it's time that we take Christ up on his offer. You know, Wednesday nights when we meet here for prayer, we have a very special, important guest with us every night. You know who that is? Jesus put it this way. Where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am in the midst of them. The early believers, the disciples, the apostles experienced this throughout the book of Acts. You read through the book of Acts, and whenever you see a, a real movement of God taking place, it was preceded by corporate prayer. The apostles, the disciples, the believers met together for prayer. Amen. Anybody else believe that? Amen. Well, we have two. We'll keep preaching. Whatever. <laughs> so, you know, it, it's, it's time that we understand and value the power, the absolute necessity of gathering together for corporate prayer, that we may see uh, what we read about in Chronicles, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and seek my face and pray, then, then what? He'll heal the land. But it's not if the pagans out on the streets of Portland repent. 
I'll heal the land. It's just my people will humble themselves. Seek my face in prayer. Well, what else has he revealed in his sovereignty to the saints of old, showing the impact of the pleas and the prayers of his own? Ezekiel, in chapter 4, verse 12 through 15, speaks well of this. After being told by the sovereign Lord, again, we're back to the sovereign Lord, uh, you, you know, in the writing of this, God could have in every single place in Scripture, from Genesis to Revelation, wherever he was referring to him, he could have just put God, G-O-D, capital G, G-O-D. But when he brings in another name, he's emphasizing something. The fact that he is absolute, he is sovereign, he is in control, he is number one. He calls the shots. But how does he choose to do that? God says, hey, Ezekiel, I want you to make some bread. By the way, you can buy Ezekiel bread. You know, you read in that context, and it tells how he did it. And you can go to the store and buy Ezekiel bread. So there, be spiritual, make some Ezekiel bread. But uh, praise God that Ezekiel was able to barter with God here, because you don't want to do it how he was first told to do it. Bake it in the sight of the people, using human excrement for fuel. The Lord said in this way, the people of Israel will eat defiled food among the nations where I will drive them. Ezekiel speaking. Then I said, not so, sovereign Lord. You see the combination there? Wow. Not so, sovereign Lord. I have never defiled myself. From my youth until now, I have never eaten anything found dead or torn by wild animals. No impure meat has ever entered my mouth. Very well. I'll let you bake your bread over cow dung instead of human excrement. God responds with a change of plan. God is sensitive in his sovereignty to Ezekiel's upbringing, to his beliefs, to his values, and so do ours. So when things don't seem right, talk to him. Ask him why. Read the Psalms. There's several Psalms where, where the psalmist says, why God? What's going on? If it's in your heart, you may as well express it and get it out. Because he knows it's there anyway. We serve the sovereign Lord of the universe who responds to the prayers of his people. What can we expect from God today as he relates to us in his sovereignty? Remember, we saw that he is holy and is righteous. Same yesterday, today, and forever. So that's how he deals with us. And in that, then, we may expect God dealing with us, then, in, in many wonderful ways, with with genuine hope in, in others that we will see as we go along here. Uh, that, that there is hope within the sovereignty of God and how he, he chooses to interact with us in Psalm 71, 5. For you have been my hope, sovereign Lord, my confidence from youth. God's not cold, he's not distant in his sovereignty, but he's close and he's involved. He gives genuine hope, not just wishful thinking. A hope resulting in a life-changing confidence. And in this day and age when we, we don't even know what we can believe, you know, you, you look at your phone, you read the news, uh, you got to check out which organization is pushing this out because, you know, the, the fake news dominates everything. How do you determine? How do you decide? You stay close to God. There's not only hope in his sovereignty, there's help, there's deliverance in his sovereignty. Psalm 109, verse 21 to 26. But you, sovereign Lord, help me for your name's sake. Out of the goodness of your love, deliver me. For I'm poor and needy, my heart is wounded within me. Ever been there? Or you feel like your heart's just being ripped right out of you? I fade away like an evening shadow. I'm shaken off like a locust. There, when the plagues of locusts would come in, and boy, they were everywhere. It'd be on you. That's what he felt like. Like the locusts being shooken off, 
shook and shaken. Well, however you say that one, look it up on your phone. My knees give way from fasting. My body is thin and gaunt. I'm an object of scorn to my accusers. When they see me, they shake their heads. Ever feel picked on? Unjustly so? Help me, Lord my God. Save me according to your unfailing love. God is near in his sovereignty to help. And because he is sovereign, he can help if and whenever he chooses. We, we saw a wonderful example of that. Pop and Mimi, some of you no doubt remember Pop and Mimi. And you may recall when she was diagnosed with cancer. Went into the emergency, she thought she was having some heart issues because she had very minor heart issues at that time. And they ran the standard tests there and didn't really come up with anything. Then they started doing scans and x-rays and found that the left lung was totally engaged with cancer. And I had the opportunity to be there when the doctor was showing the scans and all of that stuff, x-rays on the screen. And he said, it's around the trachea, it's around the vena cava, and he said, over here, it's nibbling on the abdominal wall. Pretty invasive, pervasive. So they set out their protocol, what they were thinking of doing. The oncologist said, well, if we can shrink it enough with chemo and radiation, then we'll remove the lung. Um, that was the oncologist. The, the cardiologist said, that's, that's, too, that's too invasive. Um, so they proceeded with the uh, chemo and radiation, and praise God for your prayers, those who knew them then, and the prayers of many. Um, the cancer shrunk to the point where it were totally gone, off the vena cava, off the trachea, away from the abdominal wall, out of the lung. Or there was just a little bit left, and they couldn't tell if it was scar tissue or a little cancer. Well, praise God for your prayers and the prayers of others because we saw God's sovereign will and power being released through the prayers of his people. But now maybe you're sitting here, maybe you just lost a loved one due to cancer or something else. Or maybe you're struggling with it. Well, God's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Because he's sovereign, he can choose how he decides to answer a prayer. Paul, you remember, prayed three times for the thorn in the flesh to be removed. And what did God say? Mm -mm. My grace is sufficient for you. My grace. But God can help and, and deliver because he's sovereign. Uh, there's no disappointment in his sovereignty. Isaiah 49, verse 22 to 24 this is what the Sovereign Lord says. See, I will beckon to the nations. I will lift up my banners to the peoples. They will bring your sons in their arms and carry their daughter on their hips, your daughters on their hips. The kings, kings will be your foster fathers and their queens, your nursing mothers. And just to step in there for a second before I continue with that passage, it just dawned on me the other day, our daughter, Anna, and son-in-law, AJ, who live over at Seaside Bill, uh, actually in Gearhart, but they've been fostering. So I copied that text and I, I sent it to them and I said, in God's perspective, you're kings and queens because you're taking care of his kids and he wants to love them through you. This is what the sovereign Lord says, they will bow down before you with their faces to the ground, the enemy. They will lick the dust at your feet. Then you will know that I am the Lord. Those who hope in me will not be disappointed. We of the Christian faith often use the word hope. But it's not as you would find it out in the newspaper, on the news, or anything else. Well, I hope this works out. I hope I can do this. No, it's sure. It's absolute. It's guaranteed by the word of God himself. Those who hope in me will not be disappointed. You will be satisfied. There's no disappointment with him, so trust him. Ever felt like God has let you down? That he isn't keeping his end of the bargain? Been praying for years, seeing nothing happen? Uh, Cindy and I have been praying for two of her brothers. Well, we've been married 41 years, so there you go, 41 years. 
that they would turn to the Lord. We keep praying. We've got to remember that God's ways are not our ways. He may not be on our timetable. A day with the Lord is as what? A thousand years. And a thousand years is as a day. But faith in our sovereign Lord enables us to know that in the end, we will not be disappointed. We will see victory. We will see his victory. There's direction in his sovereignty that gives peace. Isaiah 48, 16 and 17. And now the sovereign Lord has sent me, endowed with his spirit. This is what the Lord says. Your Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel, I am the Lord your God who teaches you what is best for you and directs you in the way that you should go. Feeling lost, wondering what God may have for you at this point in your life? Wondering which way to turn? He promises direction. What is best for you? Directing you which way you should go. There is direction in the sovereignty of God. It's a direction that gives peace as we continue there. It's good for you and your kids, verse 18, if only you had paid attention to my commands, your peace would have been like a river. I've got peace like a river. I've got peace. Remember that old one? If you have gray hair, you might remember it. But anyway, you guys never, you haven't heard of it, I know. <clears throat> and I wouldn't dare try to sing it for you either. Uh, but is your life in turmoil? You've got problems going on. Peace like a gentle flowing river. Your well-being like the waves of the sea, strong, vigorous, thriving, pounding. Your descendants would have been like the sand. Your children like its numberless grains. Their name would never be blotted out nor destroyed from before me. God in his sovereignty wants to watch over you and your family, your kids, to give peace, to give direction in your life. There's both strength and tenderness in his sovereignty. And it's interesting how these two facets, characteristics, attributes of God are put together under the title of Sovereign Lord. See, the Sovereign Lord comes with power, and he rules with his mighty arm. See, his reward is with him, and his recompense accompanies him. That's strength. In verse 11, he tends his flock like a shepherd. He gathers the lambs in his arms. That's tenderness. <clears throat> and he carries them close to his heart. He gently leads those that have young, tenderness, strength, balanced together under the title of the Sovereign Lord. And that for Israel and by application, certainly for us, for he is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So as Sovereign, what does he do for us? Well, he comes to us. The Lord is near. Uh, he rules. He rewards. He, he tends. He gathers. He carries. And he leads. And he can pull it all off because he's the sovereign Lord. Nothing to hinder him, nothing to hamper, nothing to stop him. And because all of these and so many more are true, there's victory, ultimately, in the sovereignty of God. Victory in our lives today. Isaiah 25, verse 6 through 9. On this mountain, and then skipping part of that, but just to catch that phrase, he will swallow up death forever. The sovereign Lord will wipe away the tears from all faces. Again, a, a reference to his tenderness, his closeness, the intimate relationship that he has and desires. He will remove his people's disgrace from all the earth. The Lord has spoken, and that day they will say, Surely this is our God, we trusted in him, and he saved us. This is the Lord. We trusted in him. Let us rejoice and be glad in his salvation. Another old song for those of us who remember old songs, trust and obey for there's no other way to what? To be happy in Jesus, but to trust and obey. This is our Lord. We trusted in him. Let us rejoice and be glad in his salvation. 
So in that salvation, what does he do? He swallows up death. He wipes away tears. He removes our disgrace. He can be trusted to deal with the worst in life. Paul, in uh, 1 Corinthians 15, in that section 54 to 57, uh, refers back to the Isaiah passage, um, asking, O death, where is your sting? O grave, where is your victory? Death is swallowed up in victory. The grave has no victory over us. The grave is but our graduation. The grave is but doorways cut in sod to enter us into his eternal presence. Victory is ours through the resurrected Christ. So trust him. There's victory not only for today through God's sovereignty, but victory is promised in the end. In Philippians 2.10, at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth. And every tongue confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And victory is also seen uh, in the book of Revelation, different places there, but in chapter 21, verse 1 through 7. And I, John, saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared, adorned as a bride for her husband. Then I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them and be their God. And that's victory that we're talking about here, ultimate victory. And God will wipe away all tears from their eyes. There's his compassion, his tenderness, and his sovereignty. And there shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain. For the former things have passed away. And he that sat on the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said unto me, Write, these words are true and faithful. Every word of God is true and faithful. And he said unto me, It is done. I am, I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give unto him that is a thirst of the fountain of the water of life freely. He that overcometh shall inherit all things. And I will be his God and he shall be my son. What's our word for today out of all of this? Hang in there. God is sovereign. He's still on the throne. He is king of kings. He is Lord of lords. He is almighty God. He is the sovereign Lord. Because God in his sovereignty is holy and righteous, we can have hope. We can experience his help. We will find that he does not disappoint, but rather satisfies. That he gives direction, resulting in peace, benefiting both us and our children, our sons, our daughters, our grandchildren. He is sovereign, and because of that, he gives strength. He shows tenderness. Because of these indisputable facts, when based on faith, lived out on faith, there's great boldness, even in the difficult times in which we live. And that being the final point under the sovereignty of God, although there are many more that we could consider if we had another year, there's great boldness for living the Christian life that comes from turning to the sovereign Lord in prayer and that prayer that can turn life's challenges and problems into opportunities, like Paul said to the Philippians, where in the midst of a dark and perverse generation, we shine like stars in the universe. The blacker the night, the brighter the stars shine. The blacker our culture and society, the brighter we can shine. He answers with the power of the Spirit of God himself. In Acts Four, verse 23 to 32, on their release, Peter and John went back to their own people and reported all that the chief priests and the elders had said to them. They said, you're not preaching anymore. Well, they were listening to a different voice. When they heard this, they raised their voices in prayer to God. Sovereign Lord, they said. And down to verse 29, consider their threats and enable your servants, enable us, to speak your word with great boldness. You're not going to preach anymore. Well, we're going to talk about Sovereign Lord about that one. Enable your servants to speak your word with great boldness. Matter of fact, God, why don't you stretch out your hand to heal and perform signs and wonders through the name of your holy servant Jesus. After they prayed, 
And this was the people gathered together. After they prayed, the place where they were meeting was shaken. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the word of God boldly. And because we turn to the sovereign Lord of the universe in times of viruses and fires and pressures and problems, we will not be shaken. But rather through prayer, we can in fact shake our world. When we trust in our sovereign God and when we walk in the light of his word, our Father, our righteous Father, our God, our King, our Lord, our Sovereign, we thank you that based on your word, what you've revealed of yourself, that you are mighty, that you are just, that you are holy, that you are good, that you are loving, that you are kind, that you are near, that you are warm, that you are person. Help us to walk in light of those truths. And Father, for any here who do not know you as a God of love, as John said, a God of mercy, a God of grace, a God of forgiveness. We pray that they may take you up on your offer there in that all familiar verse, John 3, 16, that you loved the world so much. You loved each person here. You loved me. That you sent your only son. That when we but believe what you have said, we will not perish, but we will have the ultimate victory of eternal life. We praise you. We love you. We thank you. Christ's name. Amen. Go in peace.